Hi guys. Okay, so welcome back to viruses. Um, also, I just posted another article under the course content where it says articles about viruses. Um, this one is really interesting because it talks about how just two tiny little mutations are what allowed um, COVID-19 to become really deadly. Um, one of the things I wanted to emphasize too, and I'm gonna put this in the notes um, that I'm gonna finally upload today, but the reason viruses can be so, the, the reason they can mutate and be able to, to go from host to host, um, like in, you know, from whether it was a bat or a snake into humans, is simply because, as I mentioned before, their genome is so small. So I actually got some numbers, okay? So the COVID-19 virus, for example, is about 30,000 base pairs. Um, and if you were to divide that into um, a bacterial genome, which is about 600,000 base pairs, basically you could fit that virus genome inside a bacteria 19 times, okay? If you look at how much DNA you have, you have 94,000 times as much DNA as a virus has. So um, remember how we talked about in genetics about silent mutations? And the reason you guys can kind of rack those up and not worry about it is because you have so much DNA and a lot of it doesn't code for anything. And so you can rack up these silent mutations. A virus, if there's a mutation, chances are it's gonna affect something. Um, they don't really have silent mutations because their genome is so small and compact, which means that one little change, um, whether it's you know from an A to a T or you know a little deletion, that's gonna pack a big punch in a virus because it is so small. Okay, so I'm gonna put those numbers on the notes. Nothing that you need to memorize for a quiz or an exam. Um, it's just kind of interesting to see the numbers and just realize how tiny viruses are in terms of their nucleic acid, and that's you know what allows them to to you know, mutate so quickly. It's also a problem because um, because they mutate so quickly, you can develop a vaccine and yay, it works for this particular strain of a virus, but then the virus mutates and now perhaps that vaccine doesn't work um, because the virus has actually changed. So something to keep in mind for um, vaccines as well. I'm hoping that's not the place, the the you know the case with COVID nineteen. I'm hoping that we get a vaccine going, um, but you know time will tell. Okay, so I wanted to talk about some important viruses. Now, one of the things that you're going to do, and I'm going to probably open this up next, probably one week from today, um, is your virus quiz and. So you're gonna have quiz number 10, which is a regular lecture quiz over the virus PowerPoint, and that's gonna cover more general concepts. But then you have a 20-point standalone virus quiz, and it's gonna be um, 10 questions, multiple choice, and it will basically say, you know, um, here's the name of a virus, what disease does it cause, or, um, here's the disease, or here's some symptoms, what, uh, what virus causes these, okay? So one of the things I'm gonna do today, and let me make myself a note, I'm going to upload um, practice virus quizzes, and these are not for credit, they're just, you know, like five questions long, but if you wanna look at them, it will give you an idea of the format of the 20 point virus quiz. Okay, so that'll be coming up. I will send out an email. Um, and when I do, I will send you a remind text to um, have you go in and read that email. Okie doke, so let's talk about some important viruses. So whenever you see the prefix H-E-P-A or HEPA, that means that that is a virus that infects the liver. Okay, so the common ones that we see in the United States 
are hep A, hep B, and hep C. So hepatitis A is a little different. Um, it actually travels in the intestinal tract um, and um, that's where it affects too. So um, hepatitis A causes what we call acute hepatitis. Mean, and what acute means is that if you get enough of that virus um, and you're immunocompromised enough, you're gonna get sick right away. But the good news is then it goes away. You've cleared the virus out of your system. Okay, that's what an acute disease means versus a chronic disease. And it has to do with how the virus infects the cell, which we'll get to a little later in lecture. Okay, but Hep A, um, if you get Hep A, mo um, almost all the time it's you know basically um, some food worker um, didn't wash their hands properly after um, you know pooping, and sorry my technical words, um, and then that's how the virus is passed. And oh yeah, you get sick. Okay, you will barf and poop yourself into Johnson County if you get Hep A, um, and you'll also um, you're gonna have um, you know your eyeballs are gonna turn yellow. Um, you know, I mean, it's not fun to have, but the good news is you are going to recover from it and then you are going to clear that virus from your system. The other good news, which happened recently, is yay, there's a vaccine for hep A. Um, so always something to think about um, because, yeah, it's no picnic, but do people die from hep A? No, they just, they're sick and miserable, but they recover. Um, I suppose they could die if they had a lot of underlying health conditions or were sick to begin with, but um, usually no. It's just a, ugh, I'm miserable, and then in about a week you get better. Things are different um, with hepatitis B and hepatitis C, okay? So both of these will infect cells of the liver, but then they stay there and they will produce chronic hepatitis, which means that you can get hepatitis and then it goes away for a while and then it comes back. But the, the DNA from the virus, or you know, if it starts out as RNA, it's converted to DNA, that DNA is inserted into your DNA and then the virus can pop out and make you sick whenever it feels like it. Um, that's what we refer to as a chronic condition, okay? So the good news for hepatitis B is, yay, there's a vaccine. Um, probably a lot of you who are working in healthcare um, have already had this. Um, I know when I got it um, to work in the crime lab, it was a three vaccination series. I'm not sure if it's still that, but it should give you lifelong protection against hepatitis B. Okay, hepatitis C is another story. So this also causes chronic hepatitis and there is no vaccine available. So um, if the virus keeps coming out, eventually that can lead to cirrhosis or scarring of the liver, um, which we commonly see, for example, in you know chronic or long-term alcoholics. And then if you have that, that can lead to liver cancer. And unless you get a liver transplant, you know, it's going to be fatal. Um, I know there are some medications out now that, um, you know, say that they can cure someone of their hepatitis C. Um, I actually have a friend who has used one of these medications and yeah, he's been virus free. So um, I, you know, haven't studied the literature on those medications, but, um, you know, they seem to work, but you know what would be great? Not getting hep C in the first place. So it's too bad that there's not a vaccine for it. Um, I also want to caution that hepatitis C, okay, and granted, we're not talking about COVID-19 here. Let's pretend that, you know, before that existed. Um, hepatitis C is the virus that scares me the most when I think of you guys who are working in healthcare. And the reason is it is a very very hardy virus and it can remain active or infectious in dried stains up to two weeks, 10 days to two weeks. So, you know, if you're changing um, a patient's sheets where maybe they have some dried, you know, blood stains or other body fluid stains, 
um, you know, hepatitis C could potentially be active. Um, you know, if you're changing patient bandages, for example. So yeah, hep C is the one that kind of scares me the most. And I kind of like my students when they're in a healthcare environment to, you know, protect yourself as if every patient had hep C. Um, you know, like I said, obviously you're protecting yourself hopefully a lot because we're in the, the age of COVID-19, but um, yeah, hep C is a very hardy virus. Okay, varicella zoster um, used to be called, what was it, um, herpes zoster. Okay, that's changed the name. And this causes chicken pox. Okay, now chicken pox, um, also I want to caution, remember there's a difference between the name of the virus and the disease that it causes. Okay, so some students call this the chicken pox virus. Um, that's not accurate. The virus is varicella zoster. The disease that it causes is chicken pox. Okay, so chicken pox is kind of interesting because, you know, when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, um, you know, and moms, a lot of moms were stay at home moms at the time. If one kid in the neighborhood had chicken pox, literally all of the moms sent their kids down to play with that kid, which sounds crazy. Hey, Bobby, go pick up an infectious disease. But it was considered kind of a rite of passage. Um, we'd seen it for generations. It was not fatal. No one was scared of it. You know, kids got these, you know, kind of itchy lesions. You had to lay around in bed for about a week and eat ice cream and chicken noodle soup. And, it, you know, it was just no big deal. I remember having them. My mom covered me in calamine lotion. But other than that, I felt fine. It was like, yay, I get to stay home and watch TV and eat ding-dongs or whatever, you know, I was doing. Um, so it wasn't a big deal. Where it becomes a big deal is when a person who has had chicken pox, so we know they have the virus, the virus then travels to the spinal cord where it can later produce a disease called shingles. And shingles, as I can tell you from personal experience, because I've had it four times, is the worst. It's incredibly painful. And my outbreaks weren't even that bad. Okay, so thankfully your generation has um, a vaccine to varicella zoster. And it, my thing is I'm not too worried about you being protected from the chicken pox because like I said, that's kind of a, eh, you know, um, nuisance, but you know, not certainly not fatal. What I'm thrilled that you're protected against and that your kids are protected against are shingles because they are terrible. I actually want to show you um, some pictures because you know me, of course, when I have something medical happen, I have to, I always ask him to take a picture of it. Um, just to let you know, there's nothing graphic. This isn't on a naughty, you know, body part. Um, but of course I had him take pictures of it. So um, let me see where this was, here we go. Okay, so when I developed shingles, it was after I had um, a major abdominal surgery. And when shingles and a lot of these, what we call latent viruses or chronic viruses tend to come out is when the body is under a lot of stress and that stress can be physical. So in my case, it was, you know, having my abdomen cut open was a big shock to my body, but it can also be um, mental stress. So if a person, you know, if they're struggling with depression or anxiety or, you know, oh, I'm going through a divorce, um, someone close to me died, that can also trigger outbreaks. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate. Now with shingles, okay, so here's what my lesion looked like really early. And I didn't know any better. I mean, it was kind of itchy. I thought, oh, I have some eczema or, you know, did I get a bug bite? What's going on? So I didn't go to the doctor right away because, you know, big deal. It's a little bit of, you know, of a, you know, skin irritation. So by the time it turned, it got later in the infection, which I think is our next picture right here, this is what it looked like, okay? And this is actually on my lower back and it was only about maybe two inches um, wide. So we're not talking a, a scary widespread infection here. What I remember though, is it literally felt like someone was holding a blowtorch to my skin. And luckily it was over Christmas break because I remember I couldn't even have the weight of a light t-shirt 
on these lesions because they hurt so badly. So if we go back to the early picture right here, one of the things, and, and first of the thing about shingles, it tends to happen on one side of the body at a time, okay? So it either occurs on the right or on the left. It tends to not cross the midline of the body because it's living in the spinal column and so it affects either the right or the left sensory nerves, um, peripheral nerves. But I have heard of cases where a person has simultaneous infections on both sides, so you know it can happen. But it tends to be on either the right or the left. The other thing, you'll notice that the, the lesions or the scabs are round in appearance. So they look like a cluster of round um, kind of scab, scabby lesions. That's because what this is, is a virus infecting a single peripheral nerve. Okay, so all of these round lesions are associated with a single nerve that's being infected. Okay, so by the time you get to this, and I, re well, for me, that I realized, okay, something's wrong. Uh, my doctor took one look at that and said, oh, dude, you've got shingles. And the thing with antivirals, because they're not like antibiotics, okay? Viruses are inside your cells. And in this case, inside my spinal cord. Um, so if you don't get to the doctor by the time you, um, within 48 hours of noticing the outbreak, it's really too late to do anything except for treat the symptoms. And that's what happened in this case. Now, one of the things that is used to treat shingles, and it sounds crazy, it's actually capsaicin, okay, which is in arthritis cream. And the active ingredient in capsaicin is, wait for it, cayenne pepper okay so imagine taking cayenne pepper and putting it on these incredibly sore um you know kind of weeping lesions but um the thought behind it and it works um it's basically if <laughs> you know if you can think of um a, a person that's having, um, you know, like a, an extreme emotional response, and maybe you've seen this on TV where someone slaps them in the face to try to, you know, shock them out of it. Um, that's what the cayenne pepper is doing to the nerves. It's basically slapping them and saying, calm down. And um, it works. I mean, it's not fun to slather your lesions um, with cayenne pepper, but if you don't do that, if you don't calm those nerves down, you can end up with permanent nerve damage where even after the virus goes back into hibernation, you still have incredible sensitivity on the, the surface of the skin wherever the lesion was. And so that's how cayenne pepper is useful. So this was my first outbreak. Now the other three outbreaks, I knew exactly what it was. And so I was able to get to the doctor within 48 hours and they gave me an antiviral drug called acyclovir, which once again, did not cure it, but made it less painful. Okay, so that's the other thing with antivirals. You're not curing anything. You're just gonna make it, you know, hopefully suck less. Okay, so let me get back to this. Okay, so I had also, mentioned, I showed you, um, you know, the, the size of this, a diagram of this, herpes simplex. And herpes simplex um, occurs in two major forms, simplex one and simplex two. So we define these as being weeping lesions, which means that they're, you know, they kind of look like blisters that are full, they can release liquid. And actually when they're in the, the phase and shingles is like this too, when they're weeping, that's when it's really, really contagious. So you wanna try to stay away from other people. So simplex one tends to cause lesions above the diaphragm. So if any of you suffer from cold sores that are recurrent, that's herpes simplex one. Herpes simplex two causes weeping lesions below the diaphragm. So think of genital herpes. Um, now, can those potentially cross? Um, and can you have a, a simplex two infection above the diaphragm? Yep, you know, it, it's not a clear cut line, but the majority of the, um, the cases adhere to this. Simplex one, cold sores, things like that above the diaphragm. Simplex two, um, genital herpes, below the diaphragm. And once and again, 
These are perfect examples of chronic or what we call latent viruses because when do these tend to come out? When there's stress, okay? So, oh yeah, you know, that cute guy finally asked me out. I'm super excited, but I'm kind of nervous. Boom, um, the morning of your big date, you've got a big old cold sore, okay? And that is the stress that's activating these viruses to kind of come out of hibernation. It sucks, okay? But they do respond um, to stress, unfortunately. Okay, some other ones that I want you to know. And let's see, doo -doo. two more slides and then I'll stop the, um, the video. I know this is a little longer one. I'm sorry about that, but I wanna cover all of these. Um, so adenovirus, as I mentioned earlier, causes upper respiratory infections. This is the, the nasty little guy that you wake up in the morning and you kind of have a tickle in your throat, like I'm getting something. And then by eight hours later, you know, you feel like you're swallowing shards of glass because your throat hurts really bad. That's adenovirus. Rheoviruses tend to cause lower respiratory infections. Um, so these can be really, you know, troublesome to people who have COPD and other, um, you know, comorbidities in terms of lung function. Um, polio belongs to a class of viruses called picornaviruses, and it has nothing to do with corn, okay? It's not an agricultural virus. The term pico is a unit of measurement, and it's super, super, super small. So if you refer back to that diagram where I was showing you sizes of viruses, yep, really, really dinky, okay? That's a picornavirus. The rhinoviruses cause the common cold. And I always remember that one because rhino, you know, I think of a horn, where do you usually feel a cold? You know, in your nose, in your horn, that's how I remember it. Um, you know what else causes the common cold? Coronaviruses, um, you know, which COVID-19 is a mutant form of, okay? I'm not gonna um, test you about coronaviruses, so don't worry about that. Okay, influenza, this one's kind of easy to remember. It causes influenza. Um, one thing that I wanna point out, and you're probably gonna hear this from patients a lot when you're out in the healthcare environment. Oh, sorry, drinking my bang, as usual. So when a lot of times patients will say, oh, I have the stomach flu, okay? Which means, oh, I threw up and maybe had diarrhea for about 48 hours. That's not what we consider truly the flu. So influenza, its symptoms are body aches, fever, chills, and respiratory symptoms. It usually does not involve the GI tract. So normally when you have a, a patient that comes in and says, oh, I had the stomach flu. Now, could it be a virus? Yes. Um, there are a couple of other viruses like rotavirus, which causes... Um, you know, stomach upset, nausea, and diarrhea. It tends to be in little kids, but if you're the parent of little kids, could you get infected with it? Yes. Um, norovirus is the reason I will never go on a cruise ship, okay? And this was way before COVID-19. Um, it tends to occur on cruise ships and causes explosive diarrhea. That's norovirus. Um, so if you hear growling in the background, um, Gertie and Pearl are having a, a wrestling match right now. Okay, Epstein-Barr um, causes infectious mononucleosis or mono. Now in America, we are lucky enough to, you know, we kind of laugh off Epstein-Barr and we kind of laugh off mono. Um, I know I got it in high school and it was, you know, it was called the kissing disease. You know, it can be spread by, you know, teenagers sharing, you know, bottles or cans or smooching or, you know, lip gloss or whatever. Um, and normally what this causes, you know, I remember I got it again in graduate school and I loved it. It was basically, I'm sleeping 20 hours a day, waking up to, to eat and then going back to bed, which is kind of how I'd like to spend my life anyway in general. But you know, you recover from it, okay? Um, hopefully when you get it, you get lifelong immunity. Some people don't, okay? It's also the reason why sometimes vaccines don't work for everyone. Um, so is it possible to get it twice? Yes, but usually in the United States, it's a, oh boy, I have mono, I just need to rest and recover. In other countries, and especially countries that have um, high incidences of malaria, 
Epstein-Barr is linked to cancer, and um, it's known to be um, a, a virus that's associated with causing certain types of lymphoma. So we don't tend to see that in the United States because we, we're not battling malaria all the time. Okay, final slide I wanna to get to, and once again, I'm so sorry. I'm glad these, these are videos that you can just stop at any time and walk away from if you get sick of me though. So that's the good thing about YouTube. Um, so the last thing I wanna talk about is HIV, okay? And remember, HIV is the virus, and then it causes AIDS, okay? And AIDS is considered a syndrome as opposed to a disease. Um, a syndrome is a collection of a bunch of diseases and symptoms. Uh, it tends to be more broad-based. So the interesting thing about HIV is that it is an RNA virus. Okay, and I'm gonna explain that mechanism. Um, but one of the things it has to do and what RNA viruses have to do to be able to chronically infect a cell, they need to go through a process called reverse transcription. And if you can remember back to the DNA section, transcription was the process of making an RNA molecule from reading the original DNA template. Here, it's the opposite. You're taking the RNA from the virus and then an enzyme is reading that code and synthesizing a DNA strand from it. So that's why it's called reverse transcription. And the enzyme that performs that is called reverse transcriptase. Okay, so here's an example of a virus that actually carries its own enzyme with it because our cells don't normally have reverse transcriptase. Okay, the reason it does that is because it the, the RNA has to be reverse transcribed into DNA and then that DNA inserts into the host chromosome. And that's why it can keep popping out whenever it wants. So if you've ever heard of the AIDS drug AZT, what AZT does is it blocks the action of reverse transcriptase, which is awesome uh, because if it can't um, you know, reverse transcribe into DNA, it can't insert into the host chromosome and therefore it can't continue on the infection. Okay, so I will try to find a figure, and I'm making myself a note, um, on reverse transcription so you can understand what that is. And we call viruses that do this retroviruses, okay? So a retrovirus is an RNA virus that goes through reverse transcription, and HIV is a perfect example of that. Okay, so... I'm gonna stop there. Our next video, I'm gonna talk about the difference between um, an acute virus and a chronic or latent virus. Okay, hang in there guys. I'll be back with you with another um, video and then an email kind of updating you on the schedule later today. I also plan to um, grade more parasite worksheets. You're doing great on those. Um, and then enter your um, quiz scores as well, okay? Thank you, thank you for your patience with my really simple, um, probably kind of dumb videos. Thanks guys.